Okay, so this question says a cylinder. Let me just start by drawing stuff so that I can understand I'm uh, understanding things. Uh, some cylinder with some rotation inertia that's been given to us rotates clockwise. All right. Uh, oh, clockwise. That's this way. Um, about a vertical axis. Yeah, that's what I do <laughs> just instantly. It's centered with angular speed. Okay, we are given angular speed. A uh, second cylinder with a different rotational inertia. Uh, let me just uh, draw that with a different smaller, yeah, smaller rotational inertia. Uh, rotates counterclockwise. Uh, about the same axis with angular speed omega 2. Okay. If the, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that, I thought what I uh, vaguely skimmed before. If the two cylinders couple so that they have the same rotational axis, that is the uh, this axis of comma, what is the angular velocity of the combination? Uh, so this is a kind of the physical setup that uh, you have to think through. And the very first thing you would have to think through is what kind of um, tools can you use to analyze this? Because if you're thinking, you know, standard strategy, that's hopeless. <laughs> you don't nearly have enough information to work out forces between these things. So, um, the, the, you know, what I recommend at this point in the semester is every time you have a question, um, first to see if a conservation law will work. So that's my first point of inquiry. Will conservation law give me enough information to be able to answer this question? And when you're thinking about conservation law, you should be thinking about conserved quantities. And um, it's uh, kind of easy early uh, in your physics education like now, because you haven't learned that many conserved quantities. You've learned energy, or strictly speaking, mechanical energy that could be conserved. You could learn about momentum. And at this point in the semester, like really the linear momentum that you learned could be conserved if the net external force or the if the external force impulse net zero impulse. And the third thing that we are covering this week is the angular momentum. And for angular momentum to be conserved, what you need is uh, net external torque to be equal to zero. Or, you know, somehow they act in a way that they don't impart a net version of, a rotational version of impulse. I don't think we have a name. I don't think rotational impulse is a thing. Um, so in this setup, as you look at it, I hope you have some sense that if they couple and stick together, that this is not going to be elastic collision. Uh, so energy won't be conserved. That's a, um, hopefully a set, uh, intuition that you have uh, by this point after having dealt with many different conservation law questions. And as they couple, I guess uh, their total linear momentum is just zero to start. So this might hold, but it's kind of useless. So what you are holding to is the conservation of total angular momentum. Uh, because you can see that as they couple together, if they are freely spinning about the axis, then the net torque on them, net external torque on the whole system will be zero. So, so that's our starting point. If, after you've identified all that, you say, okay, uh, angular momentum is conserved, which allows you to say this. You can say that the total mo angular momentum initially is equal to the total angular momentum finally. And um, so, yeah, let's, let's just write down the expressions. So total initial angular momentum would be angular momentum of one and two. Uh, let me just uh, somewhat arbitrarily say that this is the positive direction and that this is the negative direction. You can swap them around. In fact, the swapping them around might be more intuitive, but let me just assign these as the signs I will use. So the initial angular momentum before they couple and stick together, we have angular momentum of mass one, which would be, uh, so I'm using the expression, angular momentum is rotational inertia times angular velocity, and really the non-vector version of that. Or um, I guess uh, to the extent that these are vectors, I'm indicating their, their direction with the signs. So it's going to be 
the rotation inertia of the first cylinder times its uh, angular velocity plus because it's going in the plus direction and then I'm going to subtract the thing that's going in the negative direction its own rotational inertia times its own angular velocity so that's the left hand side that's the initial angular momentum before they collide and stick together the right hand side will be hmm, I need two things one I need an expression for the total rotational inertia um, of the whole combined thing times oh and they gave, already gave us a symbol here let's use that final angular velocity and this is where your awareness of the superposition principle will help if you have a good sense of the superposition principle then you can kind of guess or get that this total rotational inertia is simply i1 plus i2 they're sticking together, they're adding together, like masses added together in uh, you know, totally inelastic collision. So, uh, so with the total rotation inertia being basically known, the only unknown is your final angular velocity. So we can solve for that. Um, let's, uh, um, let's just do this quick algebra. My final angular velocity is equal to the everything on the left hand side divided by the total angular momentum total inner rotational inertia here so i1 omega 1 minus i2 omega 2 divided by i1 plus i2 good um yeah and i think everything here is known so let me plug in the numbers i'm gonna just to bring up my calculator just type here um, do I have, I might not, I don't think I have I1, I2, or omega 1, or omega 2 defined. So let me do that. Oh, and I need omega f. Wait, I don't actually need that. Um, yeah. So my final angular speed should be my uh, I1 times omega 1 minus I2 times omega 2. Divide by I1 plus I2. I hope this kind of looks familiar from um, when we are doing totally inelastic collisions in the uh, in the translational case. This is really the rotational version of that. So let's plug in the numbers here. Substituting in I1 of we have um, I1 is 4. I2 is 1. Again, I'm just double checking they are all in basic SI units. Omega 1 is 8 radians per second, basic SI unit. Uh, omega 2 is uh, 8 also. All right. Yeah, I had a feeling I had to get a positive number this way. That's why I defined the clockwise as positive. So 4.8 is the number we have here, 4.8 radians per second. And the second part asks what percentage of original kinetic energy is lost to friction. Uh -huh. and so it's uh, referring to this part. As they stick together, there should be some mechanism for dissipating away energy. And I can imagine that being friction. So, all right. So um, let me first double check that what the number we calculated is correct. Oh, and in the direction. So because positive is clockwise, we'll say it's clockwise because it, this is a positive answer. So, okay, now that we have some confidence that omega final that we calculate is correct, let's just to work out, um, I guess the easiest thing to do is just to calculate what the kinetic energies are before the collision and after the collision and just to, uh, take a look. So my kinetic energy initially would be one half times um, uh, its angular velocity times its omega angular speed squared. Um, so rotational kinetic energy of uh, first piece and then the rotational kinetic energy of the second piece um, that will give me my initial kinetic energy right and I can just uh, plug in these quantities okay uh, let's look at my final kinetic energy my final kinetic energy would be one half times the total rotational um, moment, rotational inertia, which would be this. I'm just gonna wait, not that. Um, total, so that's just I1 plus I2. 
so the total rotation inertia uh, times the omega final i, right? That's what I meant to use. So uh, yeah, I have omega final in numbers. So let me just or omega final in symbolic form. So this is my final kinetic energy. Let's uh, um, substitute in the numbers we have. All right, so we went down from 160 joules, basic SI unit, to 12 joules, or the difference of 148 joules. So they are asking for what percentage is lost. Yeah, so that difference that I just took, that's what's lost. And as a percentage, it's that divided by 160 times 100. So 92.95%. Well, that is a high. 90. 2.5%. Yeah, I, I think that uh, sounds reasonable, especially because these two things are rotating in different directions. In fact, if their uh, rotation inertia is matched exactly, they would have lost all the energy. So the, this high uh, degree of energy being lost seems reasonable to me. Let's see if it's right. Oh, I think that's not right. What did I do wrong? Um, <laughs> you look at the numbers I plugged in. Um, uh, it should be omega f squared. Yeah. So with that, if I plug put in the numbers, fifty seven point six. Okay, so it would be sixteen uh, or uh, one sixty minus fifty seven point six. One o two point four. That's what's being lost. One o two point four divided by one sixty times one hundred. Okay, sixty four percent. Okay, that's probably more reasonable. So let me try that. Sixty four percent. I don't know. At some point, if it's a completely unfamiliar situation, your number sense might not be all that reliable, which is. Definitely my case here. I'm not all that used to combining cylinders or different rotation inertia. So 50 plus percent seems reasonable to me, but uh, this is, I guess, more reasonable and more importantly, the system thinks it's correct, so it must be correct. So 